Welcome to Northridge. We're so glad you've joined us. Let's worship together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Praise Jesus. In Jesus, the name above every other name. In Jesus, the only one who could ever say. And is worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. We sing holy.
lift you high, be magnified in our lives, be magnified through our worship. Come on, won't you sing with us? Over creation, suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole earth echoing his imminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We hear Christ be magnified. Come on, Northridge, won't you help us lift this up? Let's sing together. Christ be magnified. Come on.
Great is his faithfulness, man. In a season where it just seems like everything comes crashing down on us, we're physically, emotionally drained and spent. There's, there's a temptation to question the character of God. And that song just simply reminds us that he is faithful to us. He's faithful and true, that his promises can be trusted. And I don't know if you're joining us for the first time. If you are, welcome. Thank you. But our hope and our prayer is that you would anchor your hope, your soul in Jesus Christ. Again, thank you for connecting with us today. My name is Colston. I serve here at Northridge Church as the campus pastor at our location in Grozeal. And we're just thankful that you joined us. In this moment, we're gonna take some time to, to continue to worship, to honor God, to, to praise him for who he is and what he's done, his faithfulness to us by giving. And if you're a guest, if you're logging in, if, if you're a family member that somebody sent you a link, man, we're thrilled. But just realize there's no obligation to give. But for those of you who are with us, this is your family. This is your home. Northridge is your place. We are your people. You are our people. This is an opportunity for us to worship, to honor God. So in this moment, would you do this? Would you pray with me as we give out of joy, out of worship for who God is? Let's pray. Father, we come before you. God, just humbled that you love us. Thank you 
God, for your goodness and your faithfulness in our lives. God, in a, in a season where everything seems to be crashing down, emotions are high and we don't even know what to feel, God, you are good and you are faithful and you are true. So God, today, may we anchor our souls in you. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. We give you praise and we give you glory. It's in Christ's name, amen. Hey guys, I'm Pete, one of the pastors here at Northridge. We're so glad that you've joined us this weekend. We're continuing in our series called The Anatomy of a Dream. And whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, maybe you're watching uh, on the Northridge website, we really are honored that you're with us today. We know that you could be doing lots of different things. And when you're uh, having to do church at home, there's plenty of distractions. So thank you guys for just uh, taking some time out today uh, to be with us. And uh, I really believe that uh, God has something uh, huge in store for you as we just continue our worship today. So in this series, Anatomy of a Dream, what we've been talking about is this whole idea, this whole, this whole concept that as you seek God's purposes for your life, as you seek whatever dream God has for you, um, there's often these four phases that he takes people through. And we've been using the story of David from the Old Testament, but I could have picked a dozen other characters out of the Bible and followed these same four phases. You've also seen these four phases in your own life. You've seen them in the lives of the people around you. And we kind of started in week one by talking about phase one, which is become aware. And that's the season, that's the process of beginning to discover God's purposes for your life or discovering God's dream for your life. And then last week we looked at phase two, which is encounter opposition. And in David's life, that's when he goes up against Goliath. And that's not the only opposition that he's gonna face in his life, but it's kind of that first key moment. Today we're gonna talk about phase three, which is endure difficulties. And then next week we'll wrap up by looking at that last phase, which is learn surrender. But this idea of enduring difficulties. This is a tough one. And to be honest with you, we kind of go in and out of this phase our entire life as we seek God's purposes and we seek to live out the dreams that he's given us. And we've all had dreams. We've all had wishes. We've all had desires and goals that haven't happened. And sometimes these dreams, these goals, these ideas, these wishes, they, they, they don't happen for a variety of different reasons. You know, maybe for some of you, uh, you've had the dream of, of finishing your life with your first husband, your first wife. And right now you're in a season where it doesn't look like that's gonna happen and that marriage is coming to an end and you're really struggling with the hurt and disappointment of that dream dying. 
For some of you, um, maybe this has to do with a career and you just thought for sure God was going to open up a door so that you could pursue this job or that job or this opportunity and it, it's, it's just not happening. Some of you have the dream to have kids and you want that more than anything else. You want to be a mom. You want to be a dad and you've prayed for this to happen and you've waited, you've longed for it, but for some reason, it's just not happening. You know, we all have these these dreams, these desires, these wishes. For some of you, it's just to get married. And you want that more than anything. And it's just not lining up for you. It's like we kind of go through life. And, and for most of us, we don't have to look far for an example of enduring a difficulty. Certainly not in this season, right? I mean, we're all living with the impact of this pandemic. And that's a struggle. We can point to all kinds of things in life that right now are not working out the way we thought they were going to work out. Now, in, in this series, as I already mentioned, we've been looking at the, the story of David. We've been looking at his life. And so just to review, in case you missed the first couple of weeks, you know, David's a, a, a young guy. And all of a sudden, this guy by the name of Samuel, who's a prophet, shows up at his house. And uh, Samuel's been sent there by God to select the new king of Israel. Uh, Samuel interviews all the different brothers, and he selects David. And he anoints David. He says, David, you're going to be the next king of Israel. And, and this is crazy. It's like even hard to believe for David and for his family. And it's hard to believe for a couple different reasons, to be honest with you. I mean, first of all, like there's already a king and his name is King Saul. And King Saul has a son by the name of Jonathan. And everybody just kind of assumes if something happens to King Saul, you know, Jonathan will be the next king. That's kind of the way it worked back then, right? It's also really perplexing to David and his family because David is kind of like, the lowest rank in his family. He's the youngest. He's a shepherd boy. He's a whole lot of nothing. Like it, it just doesn't add up that Samuel would anoint David, that God somehow would select David to be the next king. And we talked about in week one, like this is just one example out of scripture where we see like God is just into the unexpected. Well, time goes on. And last week, we kind of looked at this next chapter of David's life. And it's this chapter where, you know what, he's, he's just a shepherd boy, but his dad one day says, David, I want you to go to check on your brothers, take them some food to eat. He shows up. There's this battle that's going on between the Israelites and the Philistines. And there's this giant by the name of Goliath who's issued this challenge of single combat. It's kind of a big deal. Nobody wants to fight Goliath, right? Except for David. David's like, I'll do it. Like, I, I can do this. And David, again, David's not a soldier. David's not a warrior, but he steps into this moment, right? He encounters the opposition. God uses him. And with a slingshot, he takes Goliath down. And then everything changes. And that's where we pick up today. Because in one moment, David goes from like a nobody shepherd boy to all of a sudden, everybody knows him national hero, and everybody, right, wants to be friends with David. Everybody wants David on their side. So Saul is kind of whining and dining him. In fact, Saul's like, I want you to marry my daughter. And so everything's changing for David. And all of a sudden, I think what starts to happen for David is he starts to think, maybe that old man Samuel, who told me a while back ago that I was going to be a king, maybe he wasn't crazy. Like, maybe this could happen. You know, like days ago, I was a shepherd boy and now I'm a national hero. Now I'm gonna be the son-in-law of the king. Like all of a sudden, circumstantially, things begin to change. And David's like, I think there's, there's like a chance. Like this, this it's kind of all falling into place. This, 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 this could really happen. Now, let, I wanna pause for a second because I don't want this to like just be a story that you listen to. I want you to put yourself in David's shoes. Think about this for a minute because you've been there before, right? You've been there before where you had a dream, you had an idea, you had a wish, uh, you had an ambition, you had a goal. And it was kind of far-fetched in the beginning, right? But then something changed. And circumstantially, things began to shift and you started to actually have hope that it could happen. Like this is the moment when your boss all of a sudden calls you into the office and says, I want, to, I want to talk about your future with the company. I think maybe there's a promotion here for you. This is the, the night you're out with a bunch of friends and you run into this guy out of nowhere and he's like the guy of your dreams and he even gives you his number, right? Your hope goes up. This is the moment 
that the pregnancy test comes back and it's positive. This is the moment that your spouse out of nowhere agrees to go to counseling. This is the moment when the test comes back and the tumor has started to shrink, right? This is when um, that estranged family member agrees to finally sit down and talk. Like something shifts circumstantially for you. You get a piece of news, something changes, and all of a sudden you get hope. Now, up to this point in David's story, uh, scripture really doesn't indicate. I'm kind of guessing David didn't put a whole lot of hope in this whole becoming a king kind of dream. Like, you know, he, he probably is thinking, uh, there's no way that's going to happen. I'm a shepherd boy. I'm kind of a nobody. But now, like, he's the king's son-in-law. I mean, there's still some hurdles, but it's possible. And I think his hope starts to rise. But then... As circumstances tend to happen in life, something changes. And, and David starts to notice that his relationship with King Saul is different. Like Saul's acting kind of, kind of weird. Like some, something's different. Something's kind of off. He can't put his finger on it, but he knows that something's changed. And then one day scripture tells us that Saul throws a spear at David. Like he tries to kill him. And now David's like, okay, all right, there's, yeah, there's something wrong here. This relationship is not going the way that I thought it was. And this is just as a side note, this is a freebie. But if you're in a relationship and you're wondering if things are going south, the moment that they throw like a knife or a dagger or spear at you, you can be guaranteed that something is off in that relationship. You don't have to go see a therapist. You don't have to take an online quiz. Like you can just bank on it. Something is way off. And then what happens is Saul's son, Jonathan, he comes to David and says, David, um, my dad is going to kill you. Like he, he, he's not going to stop. He is going to get rid of you. And in a matter of moments, again, everything changes for David. And he has this sense that this whole dream of being the king, this whole what he believes to be God's purpose for his life, it feels like it's not going to happen. It feels like in this moment, like it's all slipping away. He doesn't feel like God's with him. He doesn't feel like God knows or God cares. He feels like there's no way this dream is going to happen. As a matter of fact, my guess is he feels like God's just toying with him. Right? He feels like God's just kind of leading him on, allowing him to get his hope up, and now it's all going to fall apart. And now what happens is David's on the run, and he's a fugitive, and he's wondering, where's God? And David does in this moment what I have done so many different times in my life when I'm in a similar situation, and I feel like what I want, what I'm hoping for, what I'm longing for and desiring for is not going to happen. He panics. And he tries to take control of the whole situation and it begins to fall apart. So let me read just a little bit of this story with you. This is from 1 Samuel chapter 21. Um, David's leaving the country and he stops at a place called Nob. And, and this is a, it's a town, it's a village essentially where all the priests lived, all right? So this is uh, 1 Samuel 21 verse 1. It says, David went to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Like, why is no one with you? So Ahimelech's confused because here's David standing in front of him. David's a national hero. David's the son-in-law of the king, right? When David went somewhere, there would have always been like an entourage of people with David. Like, you know, it just, just seems really off like that all of a sudden here is David, this national hero standing in front of him alone. So he continues, verse two, David answered to him like the priest, the king sent me on a mission. And he said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission that I am sending you on. As for my men, he's like, you know, as for my entourage that would normally be with me, he says, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. So like Ahimelech's listening to all this and I'm sure he's thinking like, this just doesn't make sense. Like, like the most famous man in the country is standing in front of me alone. He tells me his entourage is off somewhere in a distance. And even though he's the most famous man in the country and he has an entourage, he doesn't have any food to eat. But Ahimelech, even though he thinks something's kind of off, he kind of plays along and, you know, he's like, yeah, we have some bread. But all we have is like the consecrated bread that's for the priest. But if you want it, you can have it. And David's like, yeah, I'll take it. And, and what, what's happening here is David in his panic is he's spinning off lies. Obviously, he's not on a mission 
sent out there from King Saul, right? That, that it's a whole made up situation. It's a lie. He's scared. He's panicked. He's trying to cover for himself. He doesn't know who he can trust and who he can't trust. But this is a really important reminder. And I think we all have to remember this, right? In the pursuit of all your different passions and all your ideas and all the dreams and all the purposes that you believe God has for you, what we have to remember is that God-given dreams will never require you to abandon God-given values, all right? In the pursuit of your God-given dream, you're never gonna have to abandon God-given values. And when you're in that season of enduring a difficulty, right? When you're in that season where you feel like yet another roadblock has popped up in between where you are and where you want to be, it is really easy to want to take control, isn't it? It's really easy to begin to rationalize the things that you do and the things that you say. And that's exactly where David's at. Now, uh, Ahimelech just keeps asking David like all these questions because again, this whole scenario just doesn't make a lot of sense. And David's scared and David keeps lying. We look at verse eight, it says, David asked Ahimelech, don't you have like a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was so urgent. The priest replied, the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Eli is here. It's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There's no sword here but that one. David said, there's none like it. Give it to me. Now listen, you, you, have, you have to hear the suspense of this moment right here, right? And Himalek is like, you, you want a sword? Like there, we only have one, like we're a bunch of priests that are living here. We're not warriors. There's only one sword anywhere in this village. And it's one that's kind of on display. It's kind of a special sword. Maybe you've heard of it, David. It is a sword that Goliath was carrying the day that you killed him. This is a sword, David, that you took from Goliath after you'd killed him and you cut his head off. That sword, it's here. It's the only one we have. This sword is an icon. You have to hear the suspense in this moment, right? The sword is literally an icon to God's faithfulness to David. Right? The sword represents that no matter how crazy of a situation you might find yourself in, you can trust God. It's a reminder that nothing's impossible, that there's no odds that are too great, like there's no challenge that's too grand, that there's no protection more encompassing than God's protection. That's what this sword literally represents. And in this moment, David misses it. Although this is a phenomenal reminder to David in this moment that you don't have to lie, you don't have to steal, you don't have to cheat, you don't have to run away and abandon your God. He misses it. He misses the whole thing. And I think this is really interesting because I think the same scenario plays out in our lives all the time. I think our lives are full of icons of God's faithfulness that we often miss because in our most difficult moments, like when it feels like things are falling apart, we just panic and we miss it. What's also interesting to me about this is that David had actually gotten this right in the past. He misses it in this moment, but he, he got it right. In fact, last week when we were talking about David and Goliath and how nobody thought that David should fight Goliath, even King Saul, remember King Saul's pushing back. Do you remember what David said to King Saul? David pushes back, 1 Samuel 17. He says this in verse 37. He said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. See, in that moment, what was he doing? He was channeling God's faithfulness from his past. He's facing, facing opposition. He's facing Goliath. It's an impossible foe, right? But he's like, wait, I remember this time that I'm out watching sheep and I got put in this battle against a lion. I shouldn't have won that, but I did because God's faithful. There's another time I had to fight a bear. I shouldn't have won that, but I did. Why? Because of God's faithfulness. But in this moment right here, when he's on the run and he's panicked, he misses it. He forgets about the lion. He forgets about the bear. He forgets about Goliath. He forgets about all the stories he's probably been told since he was little about his ancestors and how one time they were at the Red Sea and the army is closing in. It looks like it's all over, but God suddenly opens up the Red Sea and they walk across. He forgets about the stories he's been told about his ancestors that when they got hungry out in the wilderness, God provided manna from the sky 
He forgets about the story of his ancestors when they were thirsty, how God provided water, or how when they were stuck at the Jordan River and it was flooded and they looked like they weren't going to be able to discover God's purposes for their life. And then all of a sudden, God makes a way. He forgets about all these moments that God has been faithful time and time and time again. And he thinks it's all up to him. And so he continues to control and manipulate things he was never designed to control and manipulate. And the bottom line for me, and I think for all of us, is if you don't reflect on God's faithfulness in your past, you'll never be able to trust him with your future. You got to, in those moments, as, as scared as we get, as difficult as they are, like when we panic, we feel like everything's falling apart. You got to go back to that moment that you thought you were alone, but then you discovered that you weren't. Or that moment that you thought it was all over, but it wasn't. See, let me, let me ask you a really important question. And listen, I'm not looking for a religious answer. Right? I, I want you to be honest about this. I want you to think back into your past. Has there ever been a moment in your past that would lead you to believe that God is not in control? I can't think of a one. I can think of plenty of scenarios where in the moment I thought that God might not be in control. But when I look back into my past, there's not a single moment in my life that would lead me to believe that God is not in control. But in the midst of the chaos, David forgets. What happens from here, he runs to a place called Gath. Now he's out of the country. He realizes because he's out of the country, he's in great danger in this foreign territory. So what does David do? He continues to lie and manipulate. He pretends like he's a crazy, insane person to the king of Gath so the king doesn't kill him. He just continues to lie and manipulate. He continues to abandon the very God that he could trust. Now again, don't let this just be a story that you listen to. Let's put ourselves here. What's your pattern? Like, what, what is it that, that you do when it looks like your dream's not gonna come true? What do you do when it feels like everything around you is kind of falling apart? Like, do you start to lie and manipulate? Like, David, is that what you go to? Do you reach for the bottle? Do you pop some pills? Do you just wanna kind of numb out and not think about the difficulties or the challenges in front of you? Do you retaliate against the people who have hurt you? Do you turn your back on God? How do you respond? I, th I think most of us have kind of of just a natural pattern that we tend to fall in when things begin to fall apart. See, the bottom line is this, forces beyond your control can take away everything that you possess except for the freedom for how you're gonna respond to the situation. You can't control, as you already know, right? You cannot control a whole lot of what happens to you in your life but you can control what you think and how you respond to what happens to you in life. Now, let me tell you how this part of David's story ends because it's important. Um, Saul, King Saul, who wants to kill David, finds out that he had been in Nob, that community where all the priests lived, where he was speaking with Ahimelech, where he discovered the sword, right? And Saul finds out he's been there. And so uh, Saul goes to Nob. And he talks to Ahimelech and he says, Ahimelech, did you help David out? It was like David here and you gave him some food and a sword and you know, you kind of helped him on his way. And Ahimelech's like, yeah, of course I did. Like he's your son-in-law, of course I helped him. He's like a national hero. Well, Saul is so mad that Ahimelech had helped David out that Saul has Ahimelech killed. Not only Ahimelech, Saul has all 85 priests and their families that live there in Nob. He kills all of them. Uh, Himlek actually has a son who escapes and gets away before he's killed. And he goes and he finds David and he tells David what King Saul had done to his father and to all the other priests. And in 1 Samuel 22, verse 22, we read, this is David. This is like a moment of reckoning for him. He says, I am responsible for the death of your whole family. It's like in this moment, there's this clarity for David. In this moment, like something I think changes inside of him. And for the rest of his life, he's going to carry the regret and the memory that hundreds of people were slaughtered because he used them in his lies and his manipulation because he was scared. Now, again, I, I want to get really 
personal with some of you right now because some of you are in the midst of enduring a difficulty in your pursuit of God's purpose or God's dream for your life and it's not turning out the way that you thought it was gonna turn out. Some of you are frustrated. Some of you are angry. Some of you are eyeball deep in lies and manipulation and trying to control things that you should never be controlling. But is it possible? Is it possible that all along what has felt like a huge setback is actually a setup? It's actually a setup for what God wants to do in your life. See, I, I, we talk a lot about, about change. And, and normally when we talk about change, what we think about, we associate change with new beginnings. But the reality is true transformation almost always begins when, not when something new begins, but when something old falls apart, right? When, when a certain way that you've kind of done life all of a sudden doesn't work. See, in David's case, his path to his dream, his path to the throne, his path for what he believes are God's purposes for his life in this moment, they're all falling apart. And when the path or the pain of something old, right, falling apart, like when something starts to fall apart and there's all that chaos, there's all that disruption, what happens in that moment is your soul is invited to listen at a deeper level. That's what's happening for David in this moment, right? His soul is beginning to listen at a different, di different level. And sometimes it actually forces your soul to go to a new place because the old place, it's not working anymore. This is when you need patience. This is when you need guidance. This is when you need a freedom to let go instead of tightening your controls. Because when your dreams aren't happening, when life isn't turning out the way you thought life was gonna turn out, it doesn't mean that your life is spinning out of control. It just means that you're not in control. And you need to lean into the only person who has ever been in control in the first place. And maybe for some of you, what this looks like is putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ for the first time. Maybe some of you, your whole life has been about you trying to figure it all out. You relying on yourself. You trying to save yourself and your dreams and your passions, right? And maybe, maybe in this moment, what you need more than anything else is just to surrender your life. To just say to God, I'm tired of going my way and I'm gonna go your way. And I'm gonna trust you for the forgiveness of my sins. And I'm also gonna trust you with the plan for my life. Maybe for some of you, that's what today is all about. It's just surrendering. In a sense, it's giving up trying your way and it's trusting in God. And if that's you right now, what I, I would love to do is I just wanna pray for you and I also wanna pray for all of you who right now are in the midst of just trying to endure a difficulty. Can, can we just pray together? Father God, um, for those that are listening and watching today, who maybe for the first time wanna give their life to you, they wanna trust you for the forgiveness of their sins right now, wherever they're sitting, whatever room they might be in or whatever shop they might be sitting in watching this right now. God, I just pray they pray a very simple prayer in their heart. And they would just say, dear God, I wanna surrender to you right now. I want to trust in your son, Jesus, for the forgiveness of my sins. I need forgiveness for my past and I need hope for my future. And I'm going to give my very life to you in this moment. And the Bible says that that very, very simple confession that Jesus is Lord, just believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that very simple step of faith begins our journey with him. There's many of you that are listening to this today that you've already done that. You've already given your life to Jesus, but man, you find yourself in a place today where you feel like life's falling apart. And maybe you've been on a very similar journey to that of David's and circumstantially you started to get hope. You started to get excited about something you thought was happening in your life, but now circumstantially, it feels like that's all falling apart. You feel like yet again, there's another roadblock that's popped up that's stopping you from where you are and where you actually wanna be. 
And maybe today you just need to be reminded of God's faithfulness in your past so that you can trust Him with your future. Maybe you need to be reminded today that God is at work. Even when you can't see Him, even when you can't feel Him, He is at work in your life. And some of you right now, you feel like you're just stuck and you're waiting and you're doing nothing. But in the waiting, you're not doing nothing. In the waiting, you're actually doing one of the most important things you can possibly do, which is put your faith in a God who will never let you down. Everything in this world at some point is gonna let you down, but we have a God who won't. Can you in this moment trust that He is at work? that He has a plan. Father God, we thank You for reminding us today of Your faithfulness. May You continue to lead us and guide us every step of the way, for it's in Your holy and Your precious name that we pray. Amen.
31 says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. And they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. And they will not walk and not be faint. Lord, we thank you for that truth. Lord, that we know that you're working all things out. Lord, even when we don't see it, even when we don't understand, Lord, that you're in the waiting and that we will see your victory come. So Lord, we choose to trust in your word today. And we thank you, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. We hope you feel encouraged and ready for this week. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>